daily news and analysis. We keep you informed and inspired. This is World Today. Hello and welcome to World Today. I'm Zhao Ying. Coming up, China's special envoy to the Middle East has met with Iranian officials in Tehran. How significant is this visit amid ongoing conflicts in the region? Lunar samples collected from China's Chang'e 6 mission have provided new understandings of the far side of the moon. What can we learn from these new findings? China's special Middle East envoy Jai Jun has met with Iranian officials in Tehran, where they discussed bilateral relations and the situation in the Middle East. Jai Jun said China is willing to work with Iran to deepen the comprehensive strategic partnership between the two countries, adding that China supports Iran and other regional countries in safeguarding their sovereignty, security and development interests. Both sides have expressed desire to enhance coordination on Middle Eastern affairs to promote a fair and lasting solution to hotspot issues in the region. For more, we are joined by Dr. Wang Jin, Associate Professor at Northwest University in Xi'an, China. Dr. Wang, thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure having me again. So what do you think are the key objectives of the Special Envoy's visit to Iran at this particular moment? I think the Ambassador Zhang Jun's visit is very uh, important, given uh, given you know that uh, the Middle Eastern right now is experiencing a very particular and uh, special moment, uh, because we know that uh, during the past uh, days, uh, the tension uh, between Israel and, and Hezbollah has been uh, significantly and very quickly rising, and especially Israel has launched a very large wave of attack against the targets inside Lebanon, especially the northern, uh, southern Lebanon, where the Hezbollah uh, take it as uh, take as, uh, take the area as is their own base, so it is a very uh, moment that the the tension might rise, and out of the very moment that uh, the tension and the crisis uh, between the two sides would uh, spill over into other parts of the region. So that is why China, on the one hand, uh, uh, expressed uh, the willingness uh, to. Uh, to call for the maintain and bring the peace back to the region, and then on the other hand, call for the rational and the restraint uh, at the attitudes for the regional co- countries, especially uh, there were a lot of reports, there were a lot of analysis uh, over Iran that Iran might play uh, a more, much more important role if the if if the the the, the crisis between Israel and the Lebanon will, will, will not be uh, well managed. So that is why against this backdrop that we believe that China's visit is important and it is very uh, key objective of the special envoy Jai Jun's visit is to transfer Chinese concerns and the China, China's court for peace uh, for the regional country, especially for Iran. Yeah, and, and Jai Jun also re- reiterated China's support for Iran's sovereignty and security. How do you interpret this statement in the context of current tensions in the region? Because we know that... Uh, uh, actually, Israel, if we're talking about Iran's sovereignty, Iran's security, we're not talking only about I- I- Iran's uh, own problem, but we're also talking about uh, the very possible uh, provocation, the possible uh, uh, the, the actions taken by other uh, regional actors, especially Israel, over the, 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 the Iranian's own sovereignty, Iranian's own national security, because we know that during the past uh, years that, that Israel has already launched a wave of attacks against the targets inside uh, Iran, and also Israel has already did a lot to try to provoke Iran's anger and, and drag Iran into the regional conflict. So uh, that is why China has to, on the one hand, support the sovereignty and Iran, because this is a very just a right for every independent, independent country, including Iran. And on the other hand, I think that uh, they will do, China will continue, do, continue to work very closely with Iran to help uh, the regional countries to find a solution to end the ongoing war and find the solutions to uh, pave the better way for the future peace of uh, the peaceful opportunities and bring the peace back to the region as early as possible. Yeah, so, so what do you believe forms the foundation of this strong relationship between China and Iran? Like, is it primarily driven by trade or shared geopolitical interests? or the pressure from the West to other factors? Uh, I think that both countries, we shared a lot of uh, common understandings, and we shared a lot of uh, 
uh, the, 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 the important uh, cooperation foundations based upon the uh, mutual respect and the mutual justice and the mutual equality. So that is why uh, the bilateral relations between the two countries, especially the political the trust, is so strong. And uh, I think the foundation uh, uh, actually covers a lot of areas. For example, the, the very shared idea that, uh, that, the, that any uh, hegemonic ideas and any kind of the unilateralism should be abandoned in today's international norms and in today's international agenda. And also, we all believe, we both believe that the, 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 the international uh, norms uh, should be reformed uh, in accordance with the, 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 the cause and the willingness of the third world country. So uh, one of them, uh, uh, I mean, one of them is based upon um, the very foundation is that the two sides, China and Iran, we believe that uh, in the future, much more prospect uh, uh, future will be there according to our uh, bilateral cooperation, according to our bilateral trade and bilateral ex- people-to-people exchange. So that is why I think uh, a lot of aspects could uh, uh, be covered by the future bilateral relations, and also all the kind of these aspects would will uh, will all together uh, turn into the very strong foundation for the future bilateral relations between China and Iran. Okay, and also as you mentioned earlier, Jai Jun emphasized the ceasefire in Gaza and Lebanon as a key priority. So, do, do you see China playing an active role in the diplomatic efforts to establish a ceasefire? I think actually China did a lot and will continue to do a lot. I mean, to to uh, to bring the peace back to the region, especially through the diplomatic and the political uh, channel, because we know that uh, the ceasefire in, in as you as you mentioned, the ceasefire in Gaza Strip in Lebanon is very important. Especially, it is an important priority for to end the war to start a new beginning uh, for the regional countries. Uh, but the problem is right now that uh, is, there is no direct uh, or very uh, workable uh, communication channel between the different sides, especially between uh, Israel and uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, between Israel and, the, and the Hamas in the Gaza Strip. So uh, that is why China and, uh, and together with the other states uh, in the international community will work closely to find a way out, and China will continue to it's, it's willing to continue to work hard to uh, communicate closely with the regional country and hope to bring peace back to the region. So that is why I think Jai Jun's, uh ex- expressed very closely, uh, very clear the message to the uh, uh, to to the Iranian uh, counterparts and also uh, China will uh, together with Iran to share our ideas and to find ways to help the regional countries to back to the normal uh, and also to restrain and to keep a restrained and rational attitude towards the ongoing war in the Gaza Strip and the ongoing, a very possible, going, uh, possible war, uh, upcoming war, uh, I think maybe between Israel and Hezbollah in the future. Yeah, so in your opinion, how does China's growing role in the Middle East compare to that of major Western powers? And what do you think China is, is looking for um, in this diplomatic efforts in the region? I think China's uh, role is very different from the the role uh, held by the, the other Western countries because we know that China is uh, uh, is a very country that uh, uh, shared the very ideas with the other developing countries, especially the Middle Eastern countries, that uh, no intervention should come from the West and no intervention and the hegemonic attempts should be imposed upon uh, the states in the Middle East. So that is why China treated uh, the Middle Eastern countries, as I always repeatedly stressed, that uh, the Middle Eastern countries should be treated equally uh, with respect and uh, justice. And also there were no so-called vacuum or geopolitical vacuum in the Middle East because China treats all the Middle Eastern countries equally uh, with our, as our partners, important partners. So that is why I think... Uh, Based upon that, China uh, set up a very positive image in this region. And on the other hand, China it will continue to work closely, especially through the diplomatic ways, to uh, to help the region uh, back to peace and to, uh, to set up new bridges for the communication channels between different regional actors uh, to end the possible, uh, reason, uh, all possible rivalries and the crises and divisions in this region. So that is why I think China will continue 
who played a very important and constructive active role in the region together with the regional country. Well, in a speech to the United Nations General Assembly, uh, the new Iranian president, Masoud Pajashian, said that he wants to open a constructive chapter in his country's international relations. What does that tell us about the new president's foreign policy? Yes, the, the new president of Iran, Masoud Pajashian, uh, he is very uh, active and uh, plays different uh, plays kind of the different uh, uh, diplomatic tones uh, be, with if we compare it with his uh, 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 his predecessor uh, the, the 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 former Iranian president uh, Ibrahim Raisi. So one of the most important dif- differences that British Kian has uh, very openly. Uh, stress the needs to set up the kind of the constructive uh, the dialogue with the, with other countries, especially with the Western countries, uh, because from the, uh, the, the, the 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 new president, the Bishop Petrushkian's vision that the Iran's internal uh, social and economic difficulties are largely resulted from the isolation and sanction from the West. And these sanctions and isolation are largely resulted from from the misunderstandings of the West towards Iranians' own uh, nuclear issues and uh, and the regional uh, policies. So that is why uh, Iran might, on the one hand, uh, try to uh, fix the relations with the with the other countries, especially with uh, the the Western countries, and on the other hand, will try will continue to consolidate cooperation and close ties with China, with Russia. And, and and maybe other regional countries, including Saudi Arabia, including the Emirates, and uh, maybe Qatar. So that is why I think uh, we are witnessing the new chapter for the diplomatic efforts inside Iran under the leadership of uh, the, the Masoud Petrushkian, and 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 many things might change. Where we will with many things will be changed in the future under the policies, new uh, foreign policies uh, under the new uh, Iran foreign uh, new Iran president. Yeah, actually, the new president also said in a meeting with reporters that Iran doesn't want war. They have no desire for any country's land, nor are they seeking to cause disruption anywhere. But he said it is Israel that is seeking to provoke a full-scale conflict. Um, what what do you make of those statements? Uh, I think that uh, clearly, very clearly, expressed Iran's uh, policies towards. The ongoing crisis, ongoing and the rising crisis in the Middle East, especially, especially we know that he, he, from the perspective of many an- analysis, especially from the Western countries' analysis, that Iran is under the, the pressure from Israel, and Israel is always trying to provoke war and drag Iran back to the original war and conflicts. But uh, from the statement made by Peter Shkian, that uh, Iran is not willing this or will not. Uh, uh, be dragged into the war, direct the war with Israel, and Iran will do its best to try to avoid the very uh, direct confrontation with Israel. Uh, and, but on the other hand, as Peter, <coughs> Peter Shkian stressed today, that uh, clearly stressed this, that Israel should be responsible for the ongoing war and the might upcoming four scale conflict in this region. And that is why he also hopes that the international community sh- could do more to help the region to con- to constrain the war efforts from Iran's perspective uh, that uh, the Israel is trying to push forward. So that is why I think for the Shkian, uh, under his leadership, Iran will watch m- much more closely with the international communities to seek the solutions to end the regional uh, crisis and tension and try to also cooperate uh, very closely with the regional countries to try to establish new kind of the diplomatic and political ties to consolidate relations with the regional countries, especially the Gulf Arab states. Yeah, and thank other neighboring countries. Yes, thank you, Dr. Wang Jin, associate professor at Northwest University in Xi'an, China. This is World Today. We'll be back. Eurozone business activity contracted sharply in September. Data from a key survey shows the bloc's dominant services industry flatlined, while the downturn in manufacturing accelerated. The preliminary composite Eurozone Purchasing Managers Index, or PMI, sank to 48.9 this month. This is below the 50 mark that separates growth from contraction. So what are the main reasons for Eurozone's contraction? For more, my colleague Zhao Yang spoke with Einar Tiangen, Senior Fellow at the Taihe Institute. 
So thank you very much for joining us, Aina. So Eurozone business activity contracted sharply in September. Is that a surprise to you? And what are the main reasons for the contraction? It's not a surprise. Um, this has been a trend that has been going for a long period of time. Uh, obviously, Ukraine and also uh, the pandemic uh, exacerbated things. But if you look at the gross domestic product of the tw- Europeans, 27 members, and the United States, even adjusted for inflation, um, it's widened to 30% in 2023. Uh, if you go back to 2002, it was uh, only 15% gap. So you can see quite clearly that uh, higher interest rates, um, costs, et cetera, have really weighed down very, very heavily on the European. Right now, they're paying two to three times more per unit of energy than the American competitors. So you're seeing a lot of flight. You've, you've heard uh, all of the uh, talk about closing factories of Volkswagen, um, chemical factories, BASF, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And Europe's largest economy, Germany, saw its decline deepen. So what are the challenges that Germany's economy is facing right now? Germany was an export powerhouse. I mean, you know, it's, it's brands, uh, Mercedes, especially in cars and things like this, but also in machinery, uh, were world leading. They uh, let, you know, technologically advanced uh, countries really wanted them. Uh, but things have shifted dramatically. Uh, China and other countries are producing a lot of uh, the kind of machinery. And obviously, you know, the change from internal combustion engines to demand for, um, you know, these new electric vehicles, um, that has uh, caught the, uh, the German car companies flat-footed. And, um, you know, China is dominating and they can produce cars much more cheaply that are easier to run. Uh, the question just becomes charging stations. So uh, Germany has a host of issues that it's uh, facing here, but it's all to do with competitiveness. They can no longer just rely on brand value itself. They have to respond with better products uh, that consumers want. And former ECB had Draghi delivered a report recently titled The Future of European Competitiveness. It says the European Union has fallen behind its economic peers and the gap will widen without urgent action. So what do you think are the deep root cause for that? Well, as he pointed out in the, in the report, uh, he believes that uh, the infrastructure in Europe has deteriorated, uh, that they've spent much too much money uh, just supporting the kind of lifestyle that they have and not supporting the means to make to keep that lifestyle uh, going. Uh, they see competitive threats from uh, not only um, uh, other countries in, in the East, but also from uh, the United States. So he's, he's basically saying that we have to do uh, something drastic. He's proposing about 4.5% of the yearly GDP be put back into infrastructure and improving the competitiveness of Europe. Now, to give you an idea, uh, the Marshall Plan, uh, which everyone talks about as creating miracles, that was only 1.5% of GDP. So you're talking about three times the effort. So he's really sounding uh, the alarm bells. Mm-hmm. So what are the key sectors where the EU lag behind its global competitors? Well, it's really in, in manufacturing, anything that has to uh, do with, you know, the common everyday things, you know, if you're talking about furniture and clothes, or shoes, etc., uh, necessities of life, um, they're no longer competitive. Uh, this, you know, the EU is still an export powerhouse. Uh, they, it's just the amount of exports and the trade surplus has continued to go down uh, dramatically. Um, Europe depends on this. Uh, to run their factories. Without them, there's going to be a lot more unemployed, and you get that kind of negative downward cycle that occurs. So he wants to interrupt that, um, but it's it's really going to be hard because right now they're trying to increase military spending at the same time that they need this economic spending, at the same time that the services throughout uh, the European Union, um, the government services in terms of uh, everything from medical to pensions, uh, seem to be under stress. Um, It it would mean massive borrowing, and the question is, how would that be uh, repaid? Uh, Are they thinking that they can just emulate the U.S. and just borrow forever? 
Mm. And Draghi's report also reveals that uh, the Europe's uh, economic growth has trailed the U.S. for over two decades, and Draghi attributed this mainly to Europe's lower labor productivity, which he says stems from the insufficient investment in innovation and infrastructure. So do you agree? And why has the investment in these areas been so low? Well, I mean, a lot of the um, sectors in the European economy are dominated by uh, two, three, four players. And they, they really want to uh, maximize uh, their investment. And I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, the German telecom uh, industry was dominated by, you know, a monopoly. Uh, basically, they just said, we're not going to invest in, um, in 4G. Uh, we'll wait till 5G. Uh, but that meant that uh, Germany, who everyone sees as this technological powerhouse, uh, was actually near the bottom in terms of speed of its internet. And in, even in schools, um, they had a, an issue that you know, very, very few um, c computers actually in the school um, at, and teaching uh, the kind of things that are necessary to help uh, develop uh, more, um, you know, technological prowess. Also, the system uh, that they had were, you know, much vaunted, where, where they were teaching technical uh, education uh, to young people as an alternative to just going to college. Um, that has fallen out of paper, uh, favor. Uh, many students do not uh, see themselves working in a factory. They want to work in an office. Uh, so there's been a, a multiple number of factors. But in the end, it's the higher costs uh, of employing somebody uh, in uh, Europe as opposed to other places. And you can quite clearly see this because in co countries in the eastern side where things are cheaper, uh, they're actually continuing to grow at a fairly nice clip. Mm. And as you earlier mentioned, a suggestion from the Draghi report is the call for a dramatic increase in investment. And he suggests that uh, Europe needs to invest between 840 billion to 890 billion US dollars annually. And that is uh, between 4.4 and 4.7 percent of the EU GDP. So Aina, how can they implement it? Do you think the EU members can get the consensus to change their, you know, fiscal policy and even the budget rules? Well, there's the rub. I mean, um, it, they, they might be able to agree to spend money, uh, to raise money, but the issue becomes how you spend it. Uh, you'll have 27 nations saying, me first. All right. And uh, that is very, very difficult. So uh, the, the real rub here isn't uh, everyone realizes that uh, Europe needs to do something. Mm -hmm. But when it comes down to the details, is there's going to be a tremendous amount of infighting. And if people feel that they aren't going to benefit from that, they're going to say, no, I, I don't agree unless I get something out of it. And this is the weakness of the EU. It's 27 member states um, that have, you know, monetary union, but not fiscal union. Mm. And the Draghi report clearly sent the message that without a fundamental shift in policy towards the innovation-driven investment-led growth, Europe risks falling further behind. So what kind of reforms do you think that the EU needs to do? Well, the EU needs to be, become more competitive. Uh, it, you know, and the question here becomes, can you subsidize your way to competitiveness? Um, and that doesn't seem to be working out. Let's, let's take Intel, for example. Uh, they've been given tens of billions of dollars, both in the U.S. and in Europe, and they're actually cutting back. Uh, a lot of insiders say, well, they just had the wrong strategy. Um, but, you know, if, if you're subsidizing companies that have the wrong strategy to the tunes of tens of billions of dollars, um, that speaks to a weakness in your understanding of the market and uh, how to go about uh, reestablishing competitiveness. It's just, it's very hard. And even in the U.S. where they're trying to make chip uh, factories, um, they don't have the engineers necessary to make the chip factories or operate them. They have to import them in. So, you know, there's real questions about, you know, does that even make sense? So uh, at this point, they have to start looking at areas where they can be competitive. Obviously, uh, they had a strong robotics uh, industry, um, ABB, but um, it has been surpassed a lot by uh, Chinese uh, companies and also uh, Korean companies. Half the world's robots are installed in China. And in fact, be during this uh, last period, you've seen a drop off in automation in both the U.S. and Europe because they said, well, we don't have the money now. We'll wait. But that's the irony. If you wait, you're even less competitive and you're more likely to go under.
That is Einar Tiangen, senior fellow at the Taihe Institute, speaking with my colleague Zhao Yang. You're listening to World Today. We'll be back after a short break. Welcome back. You're listening to World Today. I'm Zhao Yang. Scientists say the samples from the far side of the moon are helpful in understanding the history of the celestial body. They have been studying the soil brought back by China's Chang'e 6 mission. The samples from near the moon's south pole also provide evidence for the, for the early formation, volcanic activities, and impacts in the region. Sun Ye asked Chang'e's Six ground application system chief designer Zuo Wei about their findings. The Chang'e 6 returned with 1,935.3 grams of samples from the far side of the moon in late June. And now, research is revealing what the far side of the moon, the site that's forever turned away from Earth, is like. Chang'e 6 samples are different compared to samples gathered by the Chang'e 5 mission from the moon's near side. Based on current research findings, comparing the samples of the Chang'e 6 with the Chang'e 5, the Chang'e 6 samples are lighter in color than those from the Chang'e 5. Their composition also differs. The Chang'e 6 soil samples have a lower density than previous samples, indicating a more loosely structured composition. Twelve institutions in China have received the precious lunar farsight samples for further research. The China National Space Administration says applications will open for international scientists looking to gain access to the Chang'e 6 lunar soil samples, as the materials are expected to help answer major questions about the moon. Various fields are eagerly anticipating the Chang'e 6 lunar soil samples. The moon's evolutionary history is just one area of research. There are also questions about the geological structure of the far side of the moon, why the near and far sides of the moon are so different, what the composition of the lunar mantle is like, and why the distribution of radioactive elements on the moon varies. There are many, many fundamental questions to answer. More findings from the Chang'e 6 samples are expected soon. Sun Ye, CGTN, Beijing. For more, we are joined by Zhang Fan, Associate Professor of Astronomy Department of Beijing Normal University. Professor Zhang, thanks for joining us. No problem. So finally, we have a glimpse of the first ever samples collected from the far side of the moon. How significant is this? Right, so this will be the first uh, sample from the backside. Uh, previously, there had been 10 samples returned from the moon, uh, but they're all on the front side. And what it showed is something slightly weird. Uh, you know, the, the theory is that the moon formed when a protoplanet the size of Mars hit Earth, and then the uh, the, uh, the the rubble from mostly that thing uh, formed the moon. Uh, but the, the the samples that previously returned showed too much similarity between Earth's uh, materials and moon materials. Um, so that that gives a challenge to that theory. So. Essentially, if you look, go to the backside of the moon, and if you find things are quite different there, then it, it, it re reinvigorates the theory. And also, the backside of the moon is quite different in that um, it, it's, it's craters all the way through, rather than having these dark areas called lunar marais, which are basically frozen lava, which means the backside of the moon actually uh, froze quite early um, as compared to the to the front side. So this vast difference um, to get to that knowledge of how that formed, uh, you, you sort of need to to study the uh, the material difference of why that, that informs you on, on why things could could out at different rates on, on these two sides. So so the, the, this sample is, is vital for that purpose. Yes, uh, actually, the initial research indicates uh, some differences in the mineral composition between Chang'e 6 and Chang'e 5 samples. Uh, can you tell us more about uh, the initial findings and how do they reveal about the moon's geological history? Right, so currently what's revealed is a long laundry list of differences without too much detailed analysis yet. Essentially, they're just throwing out all the 
the treasure trove of facts, and the theorists can uh, can go and, and pick out what they what they need for for, for further analysis. Um, but from the very preliminary results, we we see that the uh, the sample is not a pure sample. It's a mixture of volcanic basalt, which is basically frozen lava, uh, and other materials coming from the impact of asteroids hitting other areas on the moon. The, the other areas, not frozen lava, uh, being the uh, you know if, if you imagine making making steel, you have this iron. Uh, this frozen, this molten iron, and then you have this scum, this uh, this carbon black suit on top of it. It's essentially that thing on on the moon as well, um, elsewhere, and, and that thing gets smashed by uh, the asteroids. So so everything uh, from these two two materials, from these two bodies, and also lots of uh, glass coming from the, the impact itself are all mixed into this uh, this thing. Um, so w that's that's one the one one difference uh, for, from the front sam samples. Another difference is that the basalt sample, the part, the basalt part of the sample also shows difference from the uh, similar kind of rock from uh, from those collected from the front side. And that could be quite interesting. It could be because of the uh, the thing I mentioned earlier uh, that, that, that resulted in, in, in the two sides uh, from cooling at different rates, but it could also because uh, the, uh, the, the, the back the sample on the backside of the moon, they were collected from a much deeper basin. So it could possibly be lava at deeper, deeper into the uh, the, the, the lunar's layered structures. Um, so 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 we we still need to need to figure out uh, what it is yet. Yeah. So how might these findings inform future lunar exploration missions? Right. So so for example, if the uh, if the difference in the basalt compositions comes from the uh, the you know the 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 fact it's collected from deeper down. Then it might inform us that the the moon has a has a, has an onion like layer structure, um, and uh, and to study that we we need to do more sort of studies. For example, through seismology, um, if we put seismometers a hundred meters uh, apart from each other, um, then we can learn how seismic waves. Um, travel on the moon and, and how they scatter, how the dispersion, which means different speed waves, sort of different frequencies, uh, waves, they, they, they travel at different speeds. But learning all this information, we can get a better picture of how the moon's uh, sort of different layers work. And, and, and yeah, that, that's, that's one example of how these things can, can inform on, on our future studies. Yeah, and as we know, China is also planning to launch the Chang'e 7 and 8 missions, which will lay the groundwork for the International Lunar Research Station. So could you elaborate on this, like what this research station entails and its significance for lunar exploration? Right. It's, 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 as the name suggests, it's fundamentally a research station. The timeline for it is that um, Chang'e 7 and Chang'e 8 will, will, will do the preliminary studies and they will be launched in 26 and possibly 28. And then after that, there will be uh, a, a manned mission to the moon. So, so humans, uh, Chinese uh, technologists will go there. Uh, and then, and then also uh, there will be two tech technology demonstration missions will bring sort of communication towers, things like that, um, onto the moon. And all of this together will form the basic form of the Lunar Research Station, which allows you to do some basic, simple research. And then after 2035, this research station will expand in scale and capability, so you can do substantial science on it. Uh, there are five areas being identified. One is geology, two, astronomy, uh, three, sun, earth, moon, space environment, basically space weather. Uh, four is fundamental science, like material science, biology, dark matter searches. And five is uh, in-situ resource utilization. So these five areas of science experiments will be done at the research station. Yeah, so, so what will be the key priorities of China's lunar exploration, um, including what you mentioned, uh, the manned mission um, in, in the future? Like, will these missions focus primarily on studying the lunar environment, or um, is it aimed at some potential long-term habitation on the moon? Um, so it's both. It's, it's learning the lunar environment for the purpose of, of longer-term habitation on the moon. So, so at least for the for the, for the next few missions, that, that, that will be the goal. For further our missions, you know, 
you have astronomy, which obviously doesn't have anything to do with uh, with the moon itself. It's looking out, using the moon as a base. Uh, but for the next few missions, you know, Chang'e 7 will contain a lander and fly over probe, flying over the craters to look for water, um, sort of frozen water at the bottom of those craters. Um, also, there will be lunar dust analyzer to study how the dust might affect scientific instruments. If you have lenses, if you have uh, telescopes, lunar dust being electrically charged would stick to the lens and, and cover everything, and that would be horrendous. Uh, you know, there are also, also seismometers, like I mentioned earlier, that will be important for studying the uh, to the moon. And Chang'e 8, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do other sort of in situ uh, utilization, resource utilization experiments. Yeah, and, and what role does... Yes. Um, what role does international cooperation play in, in the development of this research station? And how do partnerships with, with other countries enhance China's lunar exploration efforts? Right. Um, so, so, so the most immediate gain from international collaboration is you, you get more science experiments being put on there. For example, the, uh, the Chang'e 6 uh, mission had a uh, sort of... Um, uh, European Space Agency had a ion analyzer to analyze the solar winds interaction with the uh, with the uh, the lunar regulus, the the, the soil basically. Um, the, there's an Italian angle reflector to be able to study the moon's uh, sort of. Uh, precise location, orientational changes. And from that, you can infer the internal structure as well. And also, the uh, there's a read-on sort of uh, gas uh, analyzer to, to study sort of how di how different uh, is the, um, the lunar geology to, to that of Earth. So all of these experiments, they're international. And uh, by having this, so science is such that you, you, you essentially have one person being the total expert in one thing. So you know, having collaboration means you, you get access to a lot more different science that can be done. And in the future, there will be more substantial infrastructure help from international partners. For example, our partners might be able to provide uh, power sources that doesn't rely on solar, uh, which means you can work during lunar nights, which will be very important because Lunar nights are cold, and that's really good for precision measurements because heat creates a lot of a thermal noise. Um, so being able to work through the night will be will be will be quite uh, quite desirable, and uh, our international partners may provide that things. And otherwise, um, there are eight levels of different collaboration from the mission design down to, down to just training um, for different for 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 all international uh, for for all different countries with different levels of extra expertise in, in space exploration mm -hmm. and um, I think the, um, the the designer of the whole space station actually mentioned uh, looking to to have like on the order of 50 different international partners that's a third of all countries in the world involved in this um, in this research station so it truly is as the name suggests an international lunar research station hopefully yeah thank you John Fan associate professor of astronomy department of Beijing Normal University UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres urged world leaders to turn their promises into action on issues like conflict, climate change, and reforming global institutions. Following the UN Summit of the Future in New York last week, leaders approved the Pact for the Future. Talking with my colleague Tian Wei, Guterres highlighted China's efforts in renewable energy and poverty reduction as a model for other developing nations. Let's take a listen. Over the past few weeks, I've been trying to talk to African leaders about their views on uh, cooperation between China and Africa and their views about the UN and the world. And many of them say that they hope with the ideas of Global South and the development of South-South cooperation, there can be a new momentum. Mr. Secretary General, how do you see the roles of China, Africa, for example, these developing emerging economy, Global South, in achieving the SDGs. I know we are lagging behind, the world is, but what are going to be their role in your vision? First of all, the reason why we fight for the reform of the international financial system, the reason why we fight for effective debt relief, the reason why we fight for much more concessional funding uh, to the African countries is exactly because we want Africa to accelerate in the implementation of the SDGs. What we see 
is uh, as uh, China has aligned its global uh, development initiative with the Sustainable Development Goals, the Chinese cooperation, I'm sure, will be a very important instrument in supporting African countries exactly in the implementation of the Agenda 2030. We have been seeing from the United Nations, you personally even, trying to make the commitment and push countries forward in terms of sustainable development goals. For example, about energy, energy transition, which is so crucial. Mr. Secretary General, you and your colleagues have been working with governments to design the goals for the 2050, for example, particularly recently. How are we going to implement them? What are some of the consensus after you're traveling almost 20 days on the road that you see among economies and countries? No, we are not yet moving as fast as we would. We should. Uh, we must absolutely keep the growth of temperature at 1.5 degrees until the end of the century. Um, I think we'll have some overshooting in the next few years, so it's absolutely essential to limit as much as possible the level overshooting and to make it disappear as quickly as possible. But the truth is that emissions are still growing. So it's vital to have a drastic reduction of emissions in this decade. It is vital to move into the progressive phase out of fossil fuels. And it is vital to increase the investment in renewables and the, the transformation of the economies and the societies. And there are two very important things that are happening in China. Uh, one is, of course, the massive investment in renewables. You reached already the target for 2030. And the second is the huge multiplication of electric cars, in which now you produce more electric cars. Having said so, China, because of the dimension of your economy, and because obviously you became, to a large extent, uh, the factory of the world, uh, 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 China has also uh, a huge effort to make uh, uh, in reduction of emissions in the next few years. And uh, we trust the determination of China uh, to uh, play that role. At the same time, uh, it is very important to say, and we saw it in President Xi's intervention in the Belt and Road, that green development is a fundamental objective in the development cooperation of China with uh, African countries. And uh, we see it again uh, in the present summit the importance that is attributed by China to the uh, sustainable development uh, and to the green development as a, a fundamental vector of that cooperation. Mm. We see as the world changes, there are different ideas as to how the earlier rules can be abided by and whether there can be updates of the global rules. But at the same time, more self-interest as well. For example, about this, uh, what you consider as a very crucial energy transition. We see different governments are having very different decisions. And sometimes the pace of movement can be delayed by uh, one country's national interest. Uh, well, uh, their consensus can be harder to be reached. Mr. Secretary General, how optimistic do you have to be in your daily work? Jean Monnet used to say he was not optimistic nor pessimistic, he was determined. Okay. <laughs> and I'm determined to convince all governments that the most important national interest is to defeat climate change. Uh, I was in Shanghai. The secretary of the party in Shanghai was explaining to me that a meaningful investment is already being made to protect in relation to the rising sea level. When I was in the Pacific, the rising sea level was a major concern. I saw communities that had to move from the coast further inland with destruction taking place at coastal areas. Some islands might even disappear. So, I mean, we are facing climate change as the existential threat of our time. And the interest, the national interest of each country is to make sure we defeat climate change and we do not let our planet to be destroyed. Mm. Next year is going to be the 80th anniversary of the United Nations. I know you and your colleagues are preparing for that. From now till then, Mr. Secretary General, how would you call on the national leaders around the world to work with you and people around the world? My biggest appeal is for peace. Peace is the most important thing in life. Uh, it's 
peace in our minds, peace in our communities, peace in the world. We see so many other parts of the world uh, in which people are killing each other, in which destruction is, and in which people are suffering so much. Uh, peace is the most precious gift, and we must fight for peace. Mr. Secretary General, you see China has been confirming the reform and opening pol policy. Meanwhile, you also see this country has been working with the United Nations, bringing out global development, global security, global civilization initiatives. China is to celebrate a big anniversary coming in October 1st. Now, how do you see the importance of continued success